I am Nancy Hosapple. I am the director of the Office of Special Education at the Department of Education. So welcome and enjoy your morning. Hi, I'm Kristen Severs Kofer uh, from DOE, and Brandon and I are the co-leads for RDA, but we also have some other uh, friends from DOE too. So I don't know, I can let, well, I don't want to move. Come on over. Here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sarah Moore. I'm an education specialist at the department. I work on 1%, low incidence. That's my job. Good morning. My name is Jessica Tomasino, and I'm the preschool special education specialist. We've also got some folks from our Indiana Resource Network, or the EARN. So I don't know if you guys could stand up so we can see where everybody is. All right. So we've got the IEP Resource Center, the Indiana Secondary Transition Resource Center, I think that's who we, and InSource here today. Thanks for, so much for coming. And as we, we'll talk more about them as well, but feel free to ask them questions as well as any of us if you'd like. If you could, we'd really like you to get, um, here's the Wi-Fi information, and get on Padlet. So we're using Padlet today because it has all of our PowerPoints. That way you can follow along as well, especially with the first one. There's going to be something that we're going to click on that's going to take us to something else, and it's going to be kind of individualized, and so that way you can look at the one that's appropriate for you. So if you could hop on Padlet really quickly. And then if you brought your matrix and want to have that up, or even your planning tool possibly, you might want that at some point today. So let me give you just a sec to get on that. You can also get to Padlet through your phone, through the QR code too. Okay, hopefully you are there or maybe someone sitting next to you can help you get there. So today we want to go through a couple different PowerPoints. We want to talk about RDA, some of the changes because this is our second year of RDA. We want to go over the planning tool. We've got some information um, from Sandy Cole about an inclusion study that she did, but it's like the second version or 2.0 of her study. And then at the end, Brandon's going to go over some data disaggregation. So we originally thought today would take till about 1 o'clock, but we think it'll go, our part will go a little bit quicker. And then we had planned an hour or even more if you need it where you can work as a team if you brought your team. We can all walk around, answer questions, the planning tool being due today, although I'll get to that, so don't worry about yours being due today. But uh, people have had a lot of questions so we can sit with you one-on-one -on -one and talk through all of that. So um, we don't have an official break plan per se. There is a little 10 minutes, um, I don't know, about 45 minutes or so. But if you need, please feel to just use the restroom or whatever you need to do, step out for a second if you do. So RDA, um, we are trying to find a way to combine results indicators, compliance indicators into more of a cohesive system. The federal government gives Indiana as a state uh, a determination, and they look at results, compliance, um, fiscal things, so, and we get one score. So we're trying to do the same with you. So the Fed saw that even if states and districts, we were all 100% compliant with things, did that necessarily mean that outcomes were better? Not always. And so they want to bring in the results indicators as well. And so in the second year, we've made four different changes, and we'll talk about it as we go through, and then we'll specifically talk about each of the four changes just to make sure everybody is aware of each of those um, and we're always looking for feedback so if you notice on that padlet we have a, like a row that's got all the PowerPoints for today but we also have another row column that says uh, there's three different feedback forms please we listen to every single thing that anybody any feedback that folks send our way we really do take a look at that and so we don't want to necessarily start from scratch again of course with this um, if we can make small tweaks along the way just so we're not moving the needle every year but we would love your feedback so as we go through and if you're thinking of different things please let us know on that form so here's um, kind of what the breakdown is. When we have our results indicators together, all of those different indicators together equal 100%, and that defines then your technical assistance level. So level one, two, and three, and I have a, another slide later that'll show how that was broken down for everybody. And then the compliance, we've added compliance components and data components. So regardless, we have to do compliance for six of the indicators. Uh, it's in law statute that we have to work on those things. We also felt that some of the data, either timeliness or completeness of data, has been a little bit of an issue, so that's included in there as well. There is one way to link the two together, and Brandon's going to give more details on that later. But those two things together define RDA for us. 
So when you look at results, we've got preschool, grad rate, LRE, and assessment that are all involved in those. And we're going to break those down specifically here in a sec. And this is what your matrix looked like. I'm not sure if you, again, you brought it or not, where you could see what your percentages were, and then you could earn a score typically of one or five. Sometimes you could get a score of three, depending on what it was. So we've got I learned proficiency for ELA and math, um, growth data for those, I read proficiency, and then participation on the alternate assessment. And then just so you know, this is where the data source is. Sometimes people say, well, you've given us our data, so where'd you get that data? But it's reports that you send into us. And so whether it be statewide testing results uh, or we get growth and proficiency from the Office of Accountability at DOE, so they come to us from different places. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Brandon for the preschool information. Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Uh, we're going to go into this a little bit more in detail later, but uh, the preschool information that you have comes from ISTAR KR, uh, which is now uh, gone, but it will be uh, used the legacy for the next couple of years. Graduation rate is the four-year uh, cohort graduation rate um, for students with disabilities. We'll get more into that later also. And then your placement information is from your certified count of December 1, uh, in this case 2018. All of this data is from the 2018-2019 school year except graduation, which uh, is not finalized until the end of the calendar year, so we have to go a year back because we do the determinations before then. And uh, what we're going to do now is talk about a little bit of the overall summary and how some of this was done at the statewide level, and you're going to talk about the groups, right? Sure. Yep. So in the past, uh, last year, we had all the districts combined together, one big group. And we got feedback that maybe that wasn't the best way to do that, that we had maybe a smaller district that was being compared to like somebody the size of Fort Wayne, for example. And they felt like, how could we then be grouped into quintiles when we're very different uh, districts? So this way, uh, Brandon kind of laid out all the districts in the state by population and found where there were kind of chunks that made the most sense. So if we split everybody into those groups, so less than 1,000 students, that's a group. So there's 54 districts there. Uh, 1,001 to 2,500, you got 130 districts that fit in there, and so on. Uh, once we got to the largest districts, um, we needed to increase that. That's a bigger gap, 10,000 to 30,000, but it, there were only like a couple, so it wasn't enough at the, the highest end, so we needed to come down a little bit so it was a big enough group to be able to compare. And then the charter schools, lab schools, state schools, uh, turnaround schools, they were just very unique, being you know, one building versus a whole district, that when you would compare things, the data just didn't, it kind of looked skewed or it didn't quite match, and so they needed to be in their own category. Um, so again, we're taking feedback on anything, so as we go through, if you want to fill anything in or you compare what you how your scores turned out this year compared to last year, was this, do you think this was more appropriate or not? Um, and so we'd just love to hear what you think. So once you get in each of those different enrollment groups, then you're separated into quintiles. So the of the groups that are with you by size, then there's five quintiles. So the top 20% of the districts in that grouping and would get five points, four points, three, two, and one, and so on. So you could earn your points depending on which quintile you landed in within your enrollment group. If there are not 10 students, in an area, then you don't get a score at all. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that part. About yeah, the I'll add to that. Uh, um, so with this, if you have, um, if you're in the 85th percentile, you're going to get five points. You know, if you're in the 17th percentile, you're going to get one point, and so on. Uh, we have a couple of tweaks to that, but overall, that's how it works and allows you to compare uh, your students' performance to school other schools of your size. Um, there are some smaller schools, charter schools, where we're seeing a lot of uh, the categories either not eligible or under 10 students. Uh, so that is something we're looking at for the future. Uh, we're going to consider that again next year. So if you have any thoughts on that, please do share, especially if you're in that situation. It's, it's you now. Oh, it's me. All right. Now I'm, riff now I'm off. I'm off kind of on my own So for a while. Uh, we're going to go through the categories here. The averages that you see 
are the averages of all the local education agencies, right, which covers all the public school corporations, charter schools, etc. So that is, uh, it's going to be a little bit different if you looked at the statewide data, but it's fairly close because this is the average of 399 minus however many weren't in the calculation uh, school corporations and uh, the student data is of course just looking at it all in one. So uh, this is our iLearn as everyone knows. iLearn, this was the first year of iLearn. We had a new, uh, new test, new scoring system, new results. So our proficiency levels for students with disabilities went from about 18% passing both sections to around 10% passing both sections. Um, and um, we used to be in the upper 20s uh, for passing one, each, each one individually and now, for, and now we're in the upper teens. So when we looked at that we said well that number is getting uh, low to the point that it's at less useful. Um, it's hard to differentiate between numbers that we see distributed that low. So we decided to take uh, approaching proficiency as a more useful measure for RDA. Uh, this is not used for accountability, which has a different set of regulations, but for our special ed RDA, uh, we did use this. So you can see they're very close, 36.31 and 36.75% is the LEA average for those. In 162 days. Oh yes, and for the, uh, for the iLearn and uh, portion of it, it's the students enrolled 162 days. That's just like accountability in your, uh, as accountable for your corporation. So students in co-ops are going back to uh, their original school corporation for accountability. Okay, so we are going to look at some of the data on this. Uh, these are all links that you can uh, click on whichever category that you are in. Um, what are we going to look at today? So I'm just going to pick uh, 2,500 to 10,000. So this is where, where I was saying if you want to click on yours based on the size of your corporation, please do that. And I'll just have this one up to show so we can see an example right look, here. Look, all the uh, little uh, anonymous things are popping up. Yep, People are logging on. on. The uh, anonymous narwhal. Yep. Anonymous wombat. wombat. Yeah, very nice. Yep. All right. So uh, we are going in to this, and this shows you where you are at, which dot you're on here. Now, someday, maybe when I have more time, or they get somebody smarter than me, uh, you can be able to click on this and they will show you which uh, dot is yours. But for now, uh, you're just going to have to try to find it on the um, axes. And we can, you can see where you're standing, how close you are to that next you know, bridge uh, uh, separator. So if you, if you have your matrix in front of you yes. and you want to look up your um, state assessment proficiency, see what number did you get between one and five, and then if you find yourself in there, let's say you got three points and you were at 40%, then you know that you were at the top of your quintile group. You were the highest within that group if you were up towards 40%. Um, some people have said, hey, I'd really like to know, uh, let's say I'm a three, I'd love to know who's at a five, because that means that you've got a corporation the size approximately of ours, but you did really well on your um, proficiency here, so can you get us information on who, like who is the top person there on number five? So if you'd want, luckily Brandon's got that information, and you could email him. Or um, you could look it up so that okay, they don't well, have to go. email me, because there we have... <laughs> We have uh, on our website, if you go to the Office of Special Education's new and improved website, uh, you click on data, we have all of the corporation's results there for all of the indicators which we're required to report under IDEA. Uh, it's called Section 618 reporting, which everyone in the bureaucratic world knows and everyone out doesn't know what it means, but that's why it's called that. Um, and so you can see uh, there, and I'm going to add eventually once this uh, roadshow stuff is over, the sizes so that mm -hmm. you'll be Perfect. able to sort by that because right now they're just listed uh, individually. Uh, but the, that'll be something that we will be doing. So you can see also uh, the range of people on the edges. So that two, three, four is going to be the way this is designed. They're usually going to be clustered pretty close together. But on the edges, you can really see the kind of uh, distribution we have. We have some um, LEAs, it's more acronym talk, uh, around 10%. Uh, 
uh, 10 to 20, and then getting up into the 50s and 60s approaching proficiency. So that is some valuable information, uh, if you're, particularly if you're in either of those areas. And the math is a little bit uh, more wider distri distribution, but this would look like, you know, roughly a bell curve um, if we uh, graphed it in that way. Okay, next item is the growth. All right, growth is the performance of a student compared to their performance the previous year. Uh, this is measured by the uh, State Board of Education's rules, which are approved and then calculated by the Office of Accountability. So how this works is, uh, and I explained this last year, for those of you who were at the um, road shows last year, we made the same kind of uh, calculation this year. You take all the students who got a specific score, say 450. I, I think that's a score that, people, that students get on, um, this would have been I-STEP, because it would have been two years ago. And you put them in a bucket across the entire state, and then the next year you, you dump that bucket out and arrange them from, from best performance uh, the, pr the following year to worst performance the following year. And then you've got a percentile range from 0 to 100 of the students. So you're starting with a population who scored exactly the same. Uh, and thus, you don't, doesn't matter what the next year's test is. It doesn't have to be the same test. You're, uh, you're looking at their growth in, com you're looking at growth as how did they do compared to the students who did the same as them last year. So this was the 82.10 was our ELA growth. 73.14 um, was our mathematics growth. And once again, this is also 162 days in the Accountable Corporation. Where do those points come from? They come from this table. Uh, this table is uh, reflecting both that percentile, but also this um, sort of provision about how the students did the previous year. So you see we have uh, three different, or two, three, and three different levels within each outcome. So PP1 and PP2 is pass plus one and pass plus two. This will probably change a little bit because the names from going to I learn to I learn, we don't have pass plus anymore, we have, what is it? Uh, above proficiency above, yeah. uh, as a pass plus. And we also have approaching proficiency, so I'm, that, this will probably change. But the basic structure, although there has been talk at the State Board of, of looking at this again, uh, will be similar. Um, and basically what this does, it shows any student who passed the previous year, no matter what their growth the following year, automatically gets 50 points. Uh, and then the highest points is, is 175 points for those who did not pass the previous year but saw high levels of growth, uh, which would be that they were in that 55th to 99th percentile of the students that scored the same as them the previous year. So uh, if you're interested in this, this is one of our growth measures. There's now a, also a growth measure that is done at the federal accountability level because we have two accountability systems now. So if you're interested in looking at any of that, I think the State Board is going to be taking this up again in the next year. So uh, if you want to provide any input, uh, I'm sure they'd love to hear it. Uh, we have the scores for this, and this is even more normally bell curvy distributed because it's sort of set up to be that way. Um, but you do see that we have some variance uh, our, but our growth scores are very clustered. So remember, we're looking at growth of all students who scored at that level. So they're not just being compared to students with disabilities, they're being compared to all students at that level across the state from year to year. And then we generate the uh, score based on just the students with disabilities. So again, you can find whatever you earned, you earn a four, what's your percent, where are you compared to the folks in your quintile? And we're ranging from about 40 at the bottom to a little over 100 uh, in both of those, I think. The, math, the English is higher. Okay, uh, I read. Now I read unlike I learn we are doing at the corporation where it was taken. Uh, the, there is no accountability provision uh, for iRead. We've put it in here. So that is your local uh, performance at wherever they took the test. And when I say accountability, I'm meaning the accountability grades that you get 
for the state and that designation, expectation designation that you now get from also the state, but that's what we call federal accountability. So that's different than this, uh, and that's why I'm, that, that's the, uh, having accountability can be a little confusing in both names. So our average passing percent of the LEAs for students with disabilities is 62.35. Um, that shows a similar gap uh, to the iLearn. Uh, and now we're going to look again at the t this middle range, 2,500 to 10,000 total enrollment. And you can see Sorry. that the distribution is a little wider here. We have, and th this is a focus in our state, uh, is our third grade literacy, right? That's why we do iRead. We have some things designed for that pre-K to third grade, early childhood, things that we want all of our students to be able to get to, to set them up uh, for, the, for the higher grades. Um, so we have a very wide distribution of LEA's performance um, in, their, uh, in this, going from you know, the upper 20s, uh, well there's an outlier there, but upper 20s and then uh, all the way up to in the 90s. So these are, remember, only, only public school corporations, uh, 25, oh, well there's a couple of virtual charters in here. But, um, so we have, um, this is you know, a pretty good comparison to see how those third graders are doing from those early years. Uh, and the I read, we will continue to measure that. Um, I just wanted to mention there is talk about using students that do well enough on iLearn that they would then automatically be entered in I read, but that hasn't been fully decided yet. So it's, it won't be happening this year anyway. All right, alternate assessment, 1% threshold. The 1% threshold is a state threshold set by the federal, not by the federal government, by, the con by Congress actually. It is in the Every Student Succeeds Act. So we, we, the 1% is not something that anybody in the federal or state department of education can change. Uh, there has been some pushback against the, what's uh, so sacred about that 1% number. But um, that's what it's going to be for the time being. So what we're doing here is not saying that you can't be over the 1%, but saying that we need to know why and we need to be taking a look at uh, the, the LEAs that are over 1%, which is the, our mandate from the U.S. Department of Education. So we did that um, by taking a look at the state rate, which we have to report our state rate and then fill out this waiver, 1.14%. Um, the state rate was our cutoff for doing a five, three, and one. Last year we only had one and five, but if you got over the uh, state rate, that's one. Under the state rate, but still over one percent, is three and five for, obviously, if your number is under one percent. So as you can see here, did you want to say anything about this? Sure. Um, so as he said, even though it's a state rate of 1%, then we do send out information to every district so that what is your um, rate? Are you over or under 1%? And so it's a combination, actually, as Sarah mentioned before, Sarah was right there, Sarah and then uh, Stephanie Thompson in the Office of Student Assessment, together they collaborate on this. And so emails are sent out to say, here's your rate. We also have to do uh, figure out the disproportionality for the kids that are taking the alternate uh, if you're over 1%. And so they send that out and say, you, let's say you are over, um, please watch this quick video. Please make sure that you've spoken to all your staff involved. And so everybody knows what their criteria are and, and that kind of thing. So in that way, um, it's not a corrective action plan per se. It's not a compliance indicator where you have to make a plan and do lots of things. We do ask that you do at least that one thing, watch a video and talk to your staff. Um, and as Brandon said, the 1%, it, where did that number come from? So they have a reasoning for that, but it's maybe 20 or so years old. And I'm in a group with a lot of, um, uh-oh with a lot of other states. Oh, 
So as we are with other states and having conversations about why 1%, but as Brandon said, unfortunately, it can't be changed. Now, the good part of this is just by having this come up as a conversation, we started at 1.25. The next year, we went down to 1.21, and now we're at 1.14. So we're making progress. Um, and if you'll notice on this screen, sorry if the size isn't large enough, it is interesting that why would kids with specific learning disability take the alternate? Because they don't have a significant cognitive disability. And so I think just looking at these numbers locally, um, even statewide, we still have 62 students that are taking the alternate and orthopedic impairment, if that's your primary disability, it maybe doesn't quite fit. Or if you're a speech uh, student, we've got a couple of speech folks. Um, Sarah learned recently, she was at something in the last couple of days with other states and in Kentucky, if you uh, have SLD as your primary disability category, you can't even take it. They won't even allow it within the state. So every state kind of is a little bit different. But So it's just, we want to bring it to everyone's attention. Again, there's not a corrective action plan. Um, I feel like at 1.14, we are doing really well. We know that everybody is doing what they should be doing at case conference committee meetings and so while well, we're not trying to say anything by letting you know about this but we do need to to let you know about it and because it is a mandate that comes down to us so anyway that was one of the changes this year being able to folks said why should we just be a five or a one so we were able to come up with an in-between with a three but again we loved your feedback so if anybody wants to provide that we would love to hear that we have gotten a lot of feedback that I mean, you've seen that number go down quite, quite a, a bit in those first two years, I mean, that, um, from where it was. And uh, we think this RDA is somewhat responsible for that because it's highlighted the, uh, the issue particularly of, of really vetting those uh, students that, uh, and seeing whether they meet the criteria for significant cognitive disability. Um, there can be a lot of frustration, of course, with the, with the state assessments. Um, and, and both at the parent and, and teacher level, but we really need to make sure that we're looking at that significant cognitive disability. All right, so now we're going to move on to the preschool outcomes, which I touched on earlier. And uh, Jessica is our preschool uh, specialist, and she will uh, share this information. Thank you. All right, so I uh, just wanted to explain a little bit more about how we get to that average for preschool outcomes. So there are three different domains that we assess. And within those domains, or of those domains, there are five different measurements. So we take two of those measurements and average them for each of those three domains to come up with our average score of 80.16%. So um, just as a reminder, with ISTAR KR, there were a couple of situations where we were finding that Instead of an exit assessment, there were uh, students marked as an interim. So those students are unable to be poor, pulled for data purposes, so those would not be part of your outcome score. So if you're looking at your matrices and you're thinking that it's a little low for students exiting, it might be because of that reason. We've found that is also happening again this year. Um, and then also, students who have entered your programs but have not been there for a total of six months prior to exiting, those scores would also not be counted towards your outcome scores. And moving forward to iSprout, there will be a comparison study done by Johns Hopkins University, and we will be using that comparison study. So your students who entered preschool programming using the iSTAR KR assessment can then be exited using the iSprout assessment without having to reassess in both areas. And then we'll use that comparison study um, from them to come up with those outcome scores. Just as a reminder, there still needs to be an entrance and an exit, and students still need to be in the program for a minimum of six months. Any questions about that? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jessica. And uh, remember that you can go back and look and see your students' ice star records once they've been, and uh, you can search them individually. There's not really an aggregating reporting feature in there, but you can pull them up and see their reports to make sure they had an entrance. And it can be at your school or any other Indiana school district. So if they move during the preschool years, it will still pull forward. Uh, our preschool performance numbers have a big variance in the lower areas, at least in this, in this particular sub-enrollment uh, group size. Um, 
and uh, then after that we're going you know kind of step stepping up to uh, very high and for showing substantial improvement our numbers for showing say level as same age peers are much much lower uh, we'll um, we'll see we had some think thoughts on how well this was being measured at the I-STAR KR so we'll kind of see with I-SPROUT uh, what, what that's going to be uh, so we we do not use the same age peers but it is available as an information only item in the RDA matrix okay graduation rate so the graduation rate is as I mentioned earlier four-year cohort graduation and basically the best way to understand this is that any student who does not get a diploma of any designation right we have general academic honors technical honors and core 40 uh, if they don't get one of those then they're in the um, non-graduate category so that includes students that are on certificate track that includes students who dropped out that in, uh, includes any student who uh, moved um, but did not um, was not picked up by another school any of those are going to be a non-graduate the alternate diploma is under development by the state board of education so some of those certificate track students would be eligible for that when that is and then this number could go up well will go up once that is the case because an alternate diploma will be able to be counted but uh, as of now we don't have the alternate diploma so we're still dealing with this whole field of non-graduates for whatever reason uh, being uh, subtracted from the graduation numbers and that's also accountable corporation uh, our graduation numbers also have kind of a wide uh, distribution uh, that we're going to see as it comes up here um, in the lower area particularly uh, we're having some very high numbers of, of graduation uh, and we're also looking in your in, in, I just learned this the other day in your accountability for your federal the strength of the diploma actually does have something to do with it does not here in ours uh, but it, it does in the um, in that calculation that's being used for CSI TSI ATSI all right least restrictive environment this is the uh, placement we're only using uh, for uh, the calculation 50 through 57 uh, as the range of this ages 6 through 21 uh, next year that will be all students uh, ages 6 to 21 and all kindergartners regardless of what age they are uh, that's a new rule that I think makes a lot of sense but makes everything more complicated uh, which is both good and bad for me good because I have more to do uh, and they don't they think that I, they'll keep me around uh, bad because I have more to do <laughs> okay so uh, but anyway that will be done and we're at a very high level compared to where we were 10 years ago uh, with least restrictive environment and uh, there, there's a this is a, a complicated subject um, we're going to talk a little bit about performance of students with inclusion in a little bit but we are meeting our state targets unlike most of our other categories particularly the assessment categories where we're, we're way off of where we hoped we would be by this point we're meeting our state targets for least restrictive environment uh, and you can see that without with service plan students removed we're at 83.20 the student rate is probably a little closer to 80 or just under if you look at all students in this state we did take out the service plans which sometimes you will see and sometimes not depending on the reporting calculation obviously that's not a case conference committee decision um, and we have districts with widely varying uh, uh, populations of, of private school students some we don't have a lot of districts don't have a private school so the only students there are homeschooled students that are being taken out but others have very high percentages of private schools in their district boundaries obviously if you're a charter school that doesn't apply to you um, okay so as I said uh, there's the numbers and you can see even in the lower range we have everybody's sort of with a couple of exceptions uh, at least in the 60s uh, for that number and why do we only have one or two number twos there uh, two points well last year we discovered that because our LRE is um, high as a state 
compared to our target, uh, we were having some schools that were scoring at two, uh, even though they had met that state target. So we bumped everybody up who would have, would have been a two, but met the state target to at least three, so that they were getting uh, more than 50% of the points at least for that particular uh, indicator. And uh, that had, a, had an effect because there were a lot of those uh, across the four different categories. Uh, charter schools, there are some really high numbers that are getting threes there. Uh, because, the, as Kristen mentioned earlier, structurally um, the uh, charter school population has a much, more, uh, much less segregated uh, special education population for various reasons. Okay, and as this is what I was just touching on. We have the additional uh, results. So this was not in last year, uh, but once again, because I wanted to create more work for myself, I decided, we decided to put this in this year. And uh, it's not scored. For various reasons, these things are not scored. Uh, but, it, but it is useful information and things that could be scored potentially in the future. Um, I am is one of those, which is your alternate assessment proficiency. Those numbers are actually higher uh, proficiency levels and approaching proficiency levels uh, for students on I am than I learn, uh, which is one of the reasons that we see sometimes that alternate assessment 1% issue, uh, that, particularly from parents who say, well, my, my kid can pass I am, but he's you know, probably not going to pass I learn. Uh, but that's why we have to be vigilant about that significant cognitive. I-STEP is on its way out. All right. Uh, this is the, supposed to be the last regular administration of I-STEP, which has been around since 1987. So that's 33 years of I-STEP. Uh, and it, 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 it was going to go away two years ago, but it was like the phoenix rose from the ashes for two more years uh, to keep going. So there will be re-administrations for for retesters for the next couple of years, but this is supposed to be the last regular administration. Um, we're going to move probably to a college uh, readiness assessment, but everybody will have to do that once because we have to have a high school accountability assessment of some kind. So stay tuned for that, but we did not include it because ISTEP is, uh, is making its exit uh, backstage. All right, and then the preschool performance data, that is what I just talked about with the um, same age, age expectations. And then preschool LRE, which are those codes 26 through 38, and those students who are in regular early childhood programs and getting services uh, with their um, non-disabled peers. Uh, we've seen changes in this. We had some substantial data quality issues that have been really started to be addressed to make sure that people are coding the students correctly. Uh, for instance, you oftentimes, if parents are putting their children uh, in the morning in, say, a, what we traditionally call developmental preschool, but in the afternoon they're going to a, uh, on their own to a daycare or an early childhood uh, preschool, that can count towards how this is done even if you are not paying for that, even if that's not part of their IEP. So that is something that we've been sharing out and getting uh, better data on that, on that to those students who are having these uh, experiences with non-disabled peers. And Jessica's got all sorts of guidance documents yeah, Jessica on that. Jessica has She'd been be great hitting to talk this. To if you have questions on that. <laughs> and the other part of this is that we are seeing movement now with uh, a lot of school corporations uh, in and small ones uh, exploiting creative ways of getting uh, their developmental preschool uh, exposure to non-disabled peers. Uh, some are all along the road on that, some are just starting. All right, uh, now we're going to talk about the final, after all the calculations, we end up with a level and Kristen's going to talk about that. All right, so with your results level, um, you've got all those different, I don't know, six indicators or whatever it may be. So then we need to group them and decide, are you going to be a level one in um, universal, sorry, a level two targeted, a level three more intensive. We did not have any level fours. Uh, so some of this we have control of how many can be in each category, and we'd love your feedback on this. So for example, the level three, there are only so many of us in the office and with our Indiana Resource Network, our EARN partners, so we have nine districts that we're going to be working more intensively with 
in this case. So we chose the number to some degree or grouped it so that it would be capacity-wise group, uh, how many we could help, how many districts we can go to. Level two, we had 78. And we'll get to that in a minute with the um, planning tool. But on the planning tool, if you were in that level two, you had to find one professional development that you would do with your staff based on one of your lower scores that you got on the results indicators. And then level one is universal. We had 287 districts there where you didn't have to worry about doing anything. Your scores were very, they were good. But again, we would love to get feedback on what would be the best way to separate this out and and with the results in general, like with compliance, we talk about everything very specifically and you have to do so much for each of the compliance indicators. Results kind of gr group together. Would you like them broken out more when we get to the planning tool, um, assistance on certain ones more than others? So any of that, we would love to hear what you're thinking. So indicators four, nine, and 10 are disproportionality and those are mine. Uh, indicator 11, meeting the 50-day timeline, that's Sarah's. She stepped out just for a sec. Uh, indicator 12, transitioning from part C to B is Jessica's, the preschool one. Uh, indicator 13, transition IEPs uh, is Michelle. She's not here with us today, but you can definitely reach her by email or any of us by email, of course, or call us. And then we have data, so that's Brandon's expertise. And so we, we'll get into what each of those reports are, but again, timeliness, that you have all the parts taken care of. We've uh, had some folks say, I, I turned it in, but then maybe something didn't get checked off. So it wasn't fully completed. And so we can always um, have him check on that and what was, what was it that was missing. Uh, I talked to a school, for example, charters are smaller. They don't do a lot of initial evaluations. And so they didn't have any and they didn't realize they still have to submit zero. So if you do have zero on something, you still have to submit everything. So please keep that in mind. So breaking down the score with the compliance indicators, for example, 4, 9, 10, again, those are disproportionality. And in, so we didn't want to show that maybe those three, if they were equally distributed with 11, 12, and 13, then DISPRO would be way a little bit more than everybody else. So what we did is we took the 8% for each of those, so 24% in total for the three. That kind of balances a little bit more with 22% for each of the other indicators. So that's why those are grouped. Our percentages look a little bit different. So if you're out of compliance, then you would show up in, for one of those six, you'd show up there not having all your points. And that would be for the first year. If you didn't correct within a year, then you would be continued noncompliance. And so you'd get less points in your indicator area, plus you'd get less points um, for continued noncompliance. And then if a third year you're still having some issues with your compliance indicator, you could have points taken off there as well. So that's what longstanding is. And we do have folks that are in some of those categories. We do, though, try and provide extra supports. The more years that you're maybe struggling with one of the indicators, we try and help internally and, again, with our resource network. And then data, we've got the ES, so expulsion, suspension. The SE, the special ed count, the December 1st count. The EV, evaluations. Uh, TR and GR, graduation and termination. We also have a Part B grant, so was your Part B grant turned in on time? And again, the feds add our timeliness with um, fiscal things as well to our determination, so we add that to yours. And then I star KR data is also on there. Anything you want to add about data, or that's good for now? Uh, no, I, I think what you said. Okay. Oh, and again, sorry, it's 80% for compliance and 20% for data. And this is what your matrix would look like with your uh, status. If, if there, sometimes you have a percentage, mine didn't, so that's why the 4, 9, and 10 are different color, shaded in differently. So you might have percentage, your status, and then your score. There are times when, for example, for disproportionality, I will have districts that don't meet the cell size, aren't big enough, don't have enough. For example, if you are um, disciplined, you had 15 kids of one race, and you need to compare to 15 kids of all other races, and you don't have that many, you won't have any points there. And then for data, we, again, we've list them there. Even though it says timely, it might not necessarily be timely, but the fact that something was incomplete. So I think for next year, we probably want to change that to make that a little bit more clear. But he's going to show you here if you have something, like I said, where you don't meet the end size, so you, that domain or that indicator isn't there, how do we deal with that point-wise with the calculation? Okay, so if you're not interested in this, you can go to sleep for the next two minutes. But um, 
if you, uh, this shows, for instance, uh, how the calculation is done. So obviously, for most of you, you're not having at least one of the compliance uh, and or results categories. Uh, if you're not a really large school corporation, uh, you usually won't be in, in uh, looked at for indicator 4, B, um, and so on. Uh, this one does have all the results. You can see they're all included, so nothing was adjusted. But at the bottom here, you can see for compliance that uh, similar to a, to a lot of the case, um, indicator 4B was not uh, evaluated for that district. So instead of that being 8%, that now becomes 0%, and everything else adjusts proportionally. So instead, your weight, 11.42. Uh, um, uh, so if you want to do the calculations uh, at home, uh, either because you want to understand it better or because that you are extremely bored, uh, that is an option and this you can show how, how we do the calculations uh, and what your final weighted index is in each of those three domains. All right, now it's time for the advertisement which we do like six times during this. So. Yes, we really want everyone to know have you even heard of the Indiana Resource Network? I hope so, but I'm always surprised sometimes when I've talked to different folks. Hey, do you know about the urns? The IRNs, we call them the urns. So the website in the middle up there has all of the resource centers. So all of these logos on, on your screen, you can hover over each one and you'll see that they go to a, um, well, you can click on them and they'll take you to the website for each of the resource centers. But we either fund fully, partially, and sometimes we don't fund some, but they're part of our network. And these folks want to help you. There are tons of them, as you can see. They cover all sorts of different topics. They are here to help you. Again, we have folks here today from the resource centers. And so um, sometimes we kind of assign them or ask them to work with you. Other times you can ask them to come to you. Uh, they have a, a list of trainings that they do throughout the year, but they are more than happy if there's a specific topic and either their training's full or you can't attend that, they will come to you, whether it be just your district, you wanna get a couple districts together, a co-op, whatever it may be, but they are, are here to help. So on all sorts of different issues and we really would like you to take advantage of them. They have so many resources available to everybody. Um, and as we've talked before, for that a student with a disability is in a classroom with gen ed kids and every teacher, gen ed teacher, every teacher has a student with a disability sitting in their classroom. So they work across the aisle, if you can say that, and they work with everybody in all sorts of different classrooms. So uh, don't just think, oh, it just as this one special ed issue, they can work with everybody, inclusivity, co-teaching, all sorts of different things. So please take advantage of them. Um, that's why we have them here to help you. So we're not going to spend extra time on this, but just to keep in mind, what are you thinking about now that we've gone over the compliance indicators? Do you have anything you're, we're really strong on this, this is our opportunity, we need to work a little bit more, here's our barrier or our challenge on some of those topics. So if you please would click on this link or use the QR code, we would love to know what do you think about how RDA is structured and any of the changes that we have discussed. We're gonna go over them right now here in just a sec and specifically so you know exactly which four things have been updated. But we do listen to every single thing that you tell us. And again, we don't need want to necessarily make a whole new system, but if we can make some tweaks along the way, we would very much like to do that so that it is um, honestly portraying you know what outcomes are for students in your districts so the links are on each of the powerpoints and then they're also on the padlet but please we do take that uh, into consideration all right so then let's go on to the specific changes just so that you know even though we've mentioned them along the way you're completely understanding what it is and here's padlet again in case you haven't been able to hop online All right, so we had four changes this year. How the system calculations are done, LRE, enrollment grouping, and alternate assessment. And then we have a document online that you can click on there, and it goes through each of these four things. So system calculations, I'm gonna let Brandon describe this one. Uh, okay, so we, we already discussed this, uh, that we uh, went separated out last year. You got one number, this year you're getting two numbers. Um, and that was done primarily due to feedback that from the um, various stakeholders from RDA last year that we were seeing 
um, uh, different issues of compliance uh, and results primarily. Now we also did some analysis on this and we found out that high compliance was not really correlated with um, low result with high results uh, and I mean if you think about that there's a lot of different processes um, a lot of different things going into that obviously if you're having a lot of compliance problems the, the, the amount of instructional leadership that's going to be able to take place is much less so it's not that they're not related but we did separate them out in this way and the compliance issues I just want to remind people that the compliance correction process is mandated by IDEA. So IDEA says you will have these six things that at least that you will uh, look at for compliance and you will have a correction process and so on. That is in the law. The RDA mandate which we received that we have to do some sort of results based accountability system uh, is an order that came from the Office of Special Education Programs. So we have folded compliance in there, but at the same time they still kind of are their own individual thing. So uh, that, that can be a little confusing, but just remember that each of the compliance indicators is part of RDA, but uh, they all have to be addressed individually uh, under the current version of IDEA, which is now 16 years old. Um, almost. So, uh, those are the two index, indices. Now, we did not want uh, school districts, um, we wanted school districts to have a real indication of how they were doing overall, however, and those who are having significant results, uh, difficulties, who are having areas where their students are performing very low, uh, that meets requirements, are, are ineligible for that one. So if you're below 41.56 on the results matrix, you have to be, you're going to go into the needs assistance even if you were compliant um, overall in, in your category. So uh, we wanted to highlight, the determination is what we are required to give every year. We have to give a determination. Uh, that level is our add-on for RDA. So uh, that's why we, we approached that in that way. Uh, we talked about this, there's your adjusted state target. The state target was a little lower than that, but we had to adjust it up given that we had taken out the service plan students on an for an individual district uh, level. And that's 80% or more of the students' time being spent in the general education classroom. And uh, we talked about why we did that. Uh, the enrollment grouping, Kristen went all through this, so I'll just uh, see it's uh, those groups. Uh, the, the, the biggest group, that's a big variance, 20,000 students from 10,000 to almost 30,000. But we really only have five really large districts by Indiana standards. Um, I say that because, you know, there's like a million people, a million students in the uh, New York City schools. So. 20,000 sounds like a small town to them, but of course, but it, we all really only have five. Uh, but that's really not enough for comparison, so we, that's why we had to have that range. And then uh, finally, uh, the last one, we also talked about this, uh, giving that intermediate level uh, to get a more accurate and um, what they call granular, that's a big, big buzzword, uh, more uh, close, uh, one, three, five, rather than one and five. And did you know there was an Indiana Resource Network? <laughs> please use them. Please, please, please. <laughs> they are the most wonderful people in the world. They're some of my favorite people in the world. So please use them as you look through your matrix and see, okay, I got some lower scores here. I'm going to reach out to these guys. And again, it's the same um, jot form for the first PowerPoint in this one, the structure, and then the changes that have happened. So we'd love to know what you think about all of that, please. And now we're going to move on to the RDA planning tool, everybody's favorite topic lately. I'm getting all sorts of emails about this because it's technically due today. 
But I hope you got my email. I sent to special ed directors that said that if you were coming to the roadshow yesterday, today, or there's two next week, you guys can have an extension because it's kind of hard to be here. And in case we say something that you thought, oh, I didn't really understand it that way, I would hate for you to then have to redo it. So you have um, a week from today to turn it in. Uh, if you, some people might have already turned it in because you may or may not have very much that you have to do, or some of you we've met with already, and so you're already on your way to filling it out. But if you need an extra week, then we're fine. We're happy to give that to you. All right, so how did the planning tool come about? In the past, we've always used a monitoring workbook, and that had just the compliance indicators on it. So 9, 10, 11, um, 4, 9, 10, and then 11, 12, 13. Those indicators were on there, and we kind of just stuck with compliance. Last year, we used what we called a success gap tool that comes from the IDA data center. And we use that just for my DISPRO districts. And it really worked well, and it dug more into system-wide issues and looking at whole systems as opposed to your one little item. And so we decided to put those things together to create the RDA planning tool. When we sent it out, we do our work on Excel. We tried to do it in Google and we had a lot of issues, um, so we didn't put it out on Google this year, although we we'll hopefully can do that next year. But when we put it out, we tried to mar mark any of the tabs across the bottom in red that your specific district needed to work on. But I guess when we emailed it out, it looked one way to us. But when you receive it with all the different varieties of technology out there, if you're a Google school, you may or may not see it or couldn't download it or had some issues. So we heard maybe if you did it on a Chromebook instead of, or don't use a Chromebook, or you, however you downloaded it made a difference. Also, if there are different versions of Excel, I guess that made a difference too. So we apologize for any. Uh, troubles that it caused when you received it not being able to see what we could see. So sorry about that. Within the tool we tried to have a lot of different functionality parts to it to make it easier. We were trying to make it a one-stop shop for you so you don't say, well, I've got my transition plan here, my dispro plan here, my LRE plan here. we got all these different plans. We were trying to put things together in one spot to make it a little bit easier. And when you think about one of those maybe non-compliant areas, you could take a look across your district. Oh yeah, we also have this and this that we want to keep in mind while we're working on this other plan. So we had good intentions with putting it on there. Some people said that's way too many tabs. There's just too much there. It's a little overwhelming. Um, other people say I'd prefer to have it there. So again, give us your feedback and what you like and don't like about it. Uh, but regardless of what you needed to work on, we wanted you to have a planning team. And as I mentioned before, there are kids with disabilities in everybody's classroom. So the more um, comprehensive your team could be, special ed, gen ed, administrators, and so on, we've got a list of, of different people we thought would be good. I just think it's going to make more of a difference when you work and you create this plan and you work on that plan that everybody's at the table together rather than it's just special ed over at the side trying to do this by themselves. So this is what it should have looked like if you had gotten one, and depending on how many red tabs. This is an example of a district that is kind of struggling a little bit. They did okay on indicator 12, but the rest of the items, they got a little work to do. And so just to show you what the red tabs would have looked like if we had highlighted them. And those are the, just the ones that you would want to take a look at. Now you can always be proactive though, and if you don't have one highlighted, please feel free to take a look at it, see what, um, what it may involve if you had had to correct something or wanted to look at any of the information that was provided, it doesn't hurt to take a look at those as well. And then each of us are assigned to different indicators, as I mentioned earlier, and so this is on the cover page of it, the tool. It's on our website as well, but please reach out to us. Um, we talked again already about uh, technical assistance, and so if you weren't sure what level you were, there's two ways to look. If you look at your matrix on the top right, it says differentiated level of support, so are you level one, two, or three? And then when you get to the um, planning tool across the bottom, there when you get to the results technical assistance tab, it'll right there, the, at the top it was blue and there was lots of instructions if you were level one, two, or three, and then right below that there was a spot where we pre-populated which level you were. We had a little snafu when the first time you, you create anything, even though we had so many eyes on that tool, we, the minute we send it out, we find out, oh, this one thing doesn't work or we did something wrong. So we very much 
apologize for any issues when using the tool if it was uh, difficult. In this, the box that I have with the arrow pointing to it, that should have been open so anybody could type into it. It shouldn't have been a drop down, so apologize for that. Um, so instead, if you you could either use the code lowercase rda2019, you can unlock the sheet and get rid of the what's there and type in. Or what we've said is if you go to the very last tab on the end of the whole notebook and you have to keep going and going and going, it's called LEA Notes and it's just an extra blank page that we put in there. You could put on that page anything that you want to mention about any of the tabs or if you couldn't fill something in then we've got that page available for everybody so for example if you were a um, level two you needed to say I'm gonna work on one professional development either I'm gonna provide it myself or I'm gonna ask one of the resource centers to provide it because I've looked at my results matrix and let's say we are struggling with uh, math growth or something like that and so we want to do um, a technical assistance on UDL differentiation something that would kind of get to that point, then um, you could put that information on the LEA notes tab. For that, if you were a level two and you needed to do a PD, we would like you, don't you don't have to recreate the wheel. So if you already, we sent this out on January 7th. If you've already done something since January 7th, maybe you sent someone to focus on inclusion, you can put that as, as something that you were doing because that, if, if that um, has anything to do with whatever results indicators you were low on. But, and it, it, you don't have to go out and do something brand new. If you have something on your calendar coming up that you were going to provide a professional development that had anything to do with those lower scores, please just go ahead with that. And again, we don't want it to necessarily cost money, so we can reach out to the resource centers to come and help you as well. So we didn't want it to be something that's too much. I would love um, feedback, though, on these different levels. Uh, seeing that we did it a little different this year with level one, two, and three, I feel like we missed it, the boat a little bit on this one. So I would love to hear what kind of assistance or what things you think would be more helpful, depending on which cheer you're in. So if you were a disproportionality, so indicators four, nine, and 10, or if you were a level three for results, there were five student success tabs that you did need to complete. If you were a dispro district, then you, we went out and we talked to you and we went through those different tabs. And if you were a level three, then you would have met or are going to meet with someone from our office and we were again gonna help you with those tabs. So data, cultural responsiveness, core instruction, assessment, and interventions are those. Um, if you don't have to do those, I, they still are great to take a look at. If you want to be proactive, if you want to, again, look at the whole system as well as the parts of the system, it's a wonderful tool and it's been very helpful with the districts that we, I've worked with that have used it. You also, when you are making notations on that or deciding, okay, in this category of data, for example, I think I'm in the planning stage, you have to provide evidence. And the more evidence you can provide helps you and the more quantitative that it can be is helpful as well when you're trying to figure out your next steps. So this is an example of one of the tabs. This is the data tab. And so it gives directions at the top. It also, they call them indicators, but subcategories. There, some of them, data only has one subcategory. Some others have two, three, or four different subcategories that go with that topic. But you would um, go in and then let's say you decide that, okay, I think I am planning. Then you would click on that little box and then it ends up highlighting the one underneath it. And then later that'll pre-populate somewhere else. Oops, sorry. Um, and then at the very bottom is where you provide the evidence. Again, the more detailed you can be, the better. Um, I have had some folks in the past, let's say for indicator 10, if you're out for white autism, well, we have this issue because everybody loves our autism program. We have the best autism program in the area. Everybody's coming for that. Maybe that's true, but how do you know that? Are you collecting data when people move in? Are you saying, are you here because the autism program? And so even though it is probably wonderful and that's qualitative, where are your numbers to prove that things are happening? The more that you have that, I think the better off you're going to be when trying to look at some of these areas. So again, we strongly suggest that if you are going to do this one and you've got your team, it really helps if everybody separately on the team does it first so that you can think about on your own, with your own frame of reference, what do I think it is, then come together, and it's interesting to see who thinks which ratings you've got. Sometimes if you all start together and do it together, uh, possibly one person says something and everybody starts going down that path, and not that that's necessarily bad, but you haven't then talked about maybe some of the other uh, opinions. So it's nice to do it separately and then come together and discuss it. So this is what I was saying, where if you select one of them, then it highlights for you. 
And then at the bottom, please give your evidence as much as possible and as detailed as possible. Then on the next tab, after you've done all the different areas, well, you should get kind of a big picture of what does your district look like. So the, the pink one is data. And then the next one is cultural responsiveness, those three subcategories, core instruction, assessments in purple, and interventions are in yellow. So you get a good picture across the whole district. Are we following, falling into different columns more so than another? Are we spread out all over the place? We've got a little bit of everything. And then also, when looking at this, what's going to how are we going to move the needle? How we, where's the most bang for our buck when deciding, now that we've seen this, what do we do? What actions do we want to take? So if there's, let's say, 15 different categories on here, you can't do 15 goals, plus you've got indicator issues and all these other things. So if you've got to narrow down to, let's say, three from here, what three are you going to work on? And so once you decide those, we try and pick ones where you're going to get high impact, but maybe you don't have to put as much effort into. Not that you still can't put tons of effort into other things, and those will be worthwhile, but depending on what you have time-wise, money-wise, and so on. So an example might be data. You have a data system already, but are you really using it to its fullest potential? Could you run some extra reports every month? Could you run them at certain schools? So if you're doing that, for example, maybe that doesn't cost any money, just one person helps run the report, then you get it out to principals or whoever might need it, and you've got all this new data that you didn't realize, oh, I didn't see that this is happening. And Brandon's gonna talk about it um, in a little bit different ways to run a report where you can put different variables together and look at things that maybe you haven't looked at in the past. And so that would be in high impact that you could have low effort and in something easier to do based on what you found on those different tabs. So once you get through the indicators and if you need to do the five student success tabs, you get to the targeted action plan. So if you needed to do one of the five student success areas, um, at the top there, it'll, it says select, and you can click, and there'll be a drop down. Let's say you wanted to do the data thing that I suggested. You would click there, choose data. Then the next one, there's a subcomponent. You click, and then you choose the drop down. And then you'll need to go in and actually type in what's your measurable um, baseline, the actions you're going to take, the timeline is going to be a drop down, what you're going to do. So you'll go across and fill that out. If you are not indicators four, nine, and 10, and not results three, you technically don't have to do that top part, so you would keep scrolling down. If you were disproportionality, you come to those next. If that's not you, keep scrolling down. After that would be indicator 11. If that's what you need to do, there would be some things that pre-populated from earlier tabs for indicator, indicator 11 that come up here, or you would click on the drop downs there, and then again, fill it out going across. After that is indicator 12, after that's indicator 13. So if you'd get to this page, please make sure you scroll up and down so that you can see everything in that section, and then you'll fill out your plan. So even if you've already looked at your indicator tab, you do still need to make sure that you take a look at this tab as well. Once you chose some dates on that last one, they will pre-populate here. We tried to make this um, as a way, we all again have multiple plans for all these different things, but if we could put them in one place for you, we tried to help out. And so you could say, okay, in January, I got these three things I need to do. I got to remember in February, this is coming up. And so to help you keep uh, things organized, because it's hard when you have different folks like us or the resource centers you're emailing back and forth, you've got these different plans. So we were trying to help put them all in one place for you. We also have um, a status where you can put if it has been started or not. Um, but we don't like the word ongoing. So if you can break something down into smaller chunks, because you could be ongoing for months and months and months. So if that's the case, let's break it down so you can do parts of whatever your whole is. This is only for the disproportionality folks. We want to check in in May and September, help you out. Is there anything you need? Are you making the progress you thought? If so, great. If not, what can we help you with? but the other districts don't have to worry about that. And again, our resource network, they are here, they're here today, they're here to help with any of those types of issues. So please, please keep them in mind. And again, I'm happy to tell you what all their specialties are at, at the end if you have any questions about that. So even though we said again that the tool is due today, don't worry about it, you guys still have another week. If you need to email and for some reason need more than that time, let me know, but, um, or I can come around and show you. Yesterday I was able to talk to a bunch of districts and they thought, oh, this is gonna take so long and we almost could do it right here. It was that fast on the, the couple things that they needed. So it's probably not as bad as you think it is or it won't take as much time as you think it will. 
And again, feedback. So this tool is new. I mean, it's two old things put together, but it is new and it has caused some issues. So I want the good, the bad, and the ugly on it. Don't hold back, please. Use this link and tell us what we could do to make it better. Uh, for example, we have all those separate tabs for compliance. We don't have separate tabs for results. We just have the one tab. Would you want six more tabs that give you information on each of those? Do you like that results are all together? Um, what do you think would be more helpful depending on what level you're in? We would love to hear any of your opinions on those things. Okay. So we're going to have a little intermission with our friend Patrick. He's going to come up and share some information about a study that Sandy Cole did, which is just wonderful. Very interesting. And it's a, she did one before, and now it's kind of like the 2.0 version, and he's going to share information. I can be your clicker person, or if you want to click oh. yourself. Um, I'll, I'll just, you, yeah, okay. I can navigate here. Right. Hi, I'm Patrick McGinley from the Indiana IEP Resource Center. Um, some of you may be familiar with the um, inclusion study that was conducted, um, I believe, last year, the last couple of years. Um, so this was an uh, inclusion study uh, done by Indiana University. Um, Sandy Cole and her shop down there conducted phase one of this inclusion study determining um, the relationship between inclusion, students in a high inclusion setting and a low inclusion setting, and students' academic outcomes. Um, they conducted a 2.0 or a phase two of this study um, just to see what results they would get if they increased some of the variables, so if they included some additional variables to these student groups that they're comparing, to see if they would get the same types of outcomes. So uh, what they looked at was, this is the same cohort of students they used in their original study, which we presented on in the uh, RDA data retreat last year around this time. They followed a single cohort of students with disabilities in Indiana, so this is every student in Indiana with an IEP who was um, enrolled in third grade in 2013 and took the ISTEP, ELA, and math assessment and IREAD as well. They followed this cohort of students through eighth grade in 2018 to see if the inclusion setting this student was placed in, or all these students were placed in, had an impact on their academic outcomes. Um, this was the data used that was obtained to use this in this study was um, obtained through a data share agreement between IU and the Department of Education. Um, and after completing this first phase of the study, as I mentioned, they decided to add some additional matching variables and, in addition to that, some school-level variables just to ter determine if those original findings held. So we're going to look a little bit into the methodology. I'm not going to go too in-depth here. But this, um, this is a graphic representation sort of of the uh, propensity score matching methodology that they used, the concept of statistical twinning. So you've got two students here. You've got a girl in the pink dress on the left side and the girl in, or yellow, uh, pink on the left side, yellow on the right side. And they are statistically identical based on the variables that were included in this study. So we're looking at the original variables from phase one of the study here. Their iRead score was the same. They had the same ISTEP, ELA, and math scores. The same days in attendance. So they looked at attendance as well. And they looked at primary disability. These girls both had the same primary disability. And we have one that was in the high inclusion setting and one in the low inclusion setting. And looking at the academic outcomes of that setting on that student or on those two students, um, the student with the, in the higher inclusion setting had higher or greater academic outcomes than the student in the low inclusion setting. So that's sort of just an, an illustration to, to show an example of what that um, statistical twinning methodology looks like. Um, so the sample here, I think as we mentioned a lot of this stuff, these were third, grades who, third grade students all who completed the state assessment. So they were not looking at students who completed the alternate assessment. These were all students that took ISTEP throughout this, the duration of this study. Um, they excluded students who had a primary disability code of speech or language, um, primarily because there just weren't enough of those students in the more restrictive settings. Pretty much all students with that primary disability of speech or language impairment, code nine, um, were in the LRE code 50, the high inclusion setting. So they generated two groups, essentially, that were approximately homogeneous. 
um, on those variables that pertain to placement. So high inclusion, the definition for high inclusion for this study was any student that was in the gen ed setting 80% or more of the day, so LRE code 50. And the low inclusion group was any student that was in the gen ed setting less than 80% of the day. So that's the resource room, that's self-contained, all the way to separate, separate day school facility and homebound. Anything that was less than 80% of the day was included in that low inclusion group for this study. Uh, now we're gonna look at some of the matching variables. You'll see some that were included in the original study. Um, the third grade I-STEP scores were used um, as matching variables for ELA and math. Um, the reading skill scores from iRead, their attendance, primary disability. So the ones they added in this uh, second um, phase were the free reduced lunch status so they could see um, socioeconomic status for these students, uh, gender, race and ethnicity, and uh, suspension and expulsion. So we, look, so we also looked at, um, in this study, we're looking at um, discipline data. And as I mentioned earlier, they wanted to, uh, the researchers wanted to include some school level matching variables as well. Uh, so they're matching based on the schools that these students are attending. So for those school variables, they included free reduced lunch status, the, or the percentage of students that have free and reduced price meals, um, and the percentage of students with different races and ethnicities. So they're really trying to factor for all these other variables that a lot of folks that were maybe criticizing the um, first phase of the study said maybe they have another impact on um, student ac academic outcomes other than placement. So they're really trying to factor for everything here with this study. Um, and again, the academic outcome variables are the same as the original study. They're looking at ISTEP, ELA, and math scores. So what were the results here? So they seem to confirm, even with these added variables, the same results as the original study. Students with pl placements classified as the high inclusion setting scored better on ELA and math for all analyses, and the findings were significant in 10 out of 10 in all of these analyses. So they confirmed the phase one results. Any questions? Okay. And so we have some conclusions and implications of this. Um, I think a study like this would be very helpful when you're having IEP team meetings, when you're meeting with parents, when you're having that initial placement decision, when you're having that discussion as to what is the most appropriate placement decision for any individual student. Um, I like the, the second point here, for educators and for parents who struggle with making the right decision, this study provides greater certainty that inclusion has a strong relationship to academic achievement for students with disabilities. I think a lot of times parents assume that more support is better. In a lot of cases it might be, but maybe more of that support should be in the gen ed setting rather than in a self-contained setting or resource room type setting for most of the day. And we have studies here, and now we've got, we're confirming with all these additional variables that yes, the high inclusion setting is a better setting for students, but why are we not doing that for all of our students? I know there's a lot of factors that go into that, but think about what are some of those uh, potential barriers to including students, especially early on, especially you know, in the younger years, because we know a lot of times if they're secluded at an early age, it's really difficult for them to catch up. So, um, so if you have any additional questions about this study, um, feel free to contact, and I'm sure Sandy is aware of this, that we're giving out her email address, but Sandy Cole at IU, cmcole at indiana.edu, and she can give you some more detailed answers in regards to this particular study. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was really interesting. They got the pushback, so they said, all right, we're going to check out, some, add some more variables, and it's still held strong. All right, we've got one grand finale presentation about data disaggregation. We saved the best for last, because who doesn't love data and having to talk about data? And again, it's on Padlet, like everything else is, if you'd like to have access to your, your own while Brandon is chatting with you. And we'd like to plug the census first because the more accurate the census is, the more accurate your funding and all, all sorts of other things are. And so uh, DOE is putting a, a push out to districts to please help your families to get signed up so everybody has accurate reporting. 
Okay, and uh, we're going to finish today with going into data, giving some examples of what you can do. We've provided you with tons of different data. You have data locally, uh, what you can do with that. And then we are going to stick around for an hour or so, and we would be happy to chat about any of these topics. Okay, so uh, this is talking about uh, kind of when you get these results, what can you do next? Um, some people I know are already doing some of the things I'm talking about here, uh, and I, they cannot be specifically um, prescribed. So uh, the data that we have at the Department of Ed is very uh, high level, right? Snapshot, it's very effective for comparing how one district is doing in relation to another. It's not particularly effective for saying what is going on specifically within that district. Um, so these are some ideas that are some of an approach kind of that you can start out uh, looking at a little bit of, uh, of your data, both the things we give and then things that you have locally that Department of Ed does not collect. So we're going to go into some of that. Uh, and this is kind of what I was just talking about. The levels of analysis, everything that is done at DOE is done mainly at the state level and comparing uh, school corporations or school systems. So that uh, very much limits the amount, the effectiveness of, the, of <coughs> your local uh, decision making based on data. All right? Data informed decision making. Uh, this is a term I prefer to data driven because data driven makes data sound like it, it does something on its own. It makes it sound like it gets in the driver's seat of a car and drives it around uh, and it doesn't. It is only um, avail useful for s evaluating what you have done, not necessarily uh, and identifying uh, places where you can improve, but then it doesn't tell you what to do. Uh, that's your expertise. So you're at the, in this, in this room most people are looking at the s school system and school level, maybe classroom, not so much student level, right? Because every student is different, very unique and has unique needs. You can collect data on that individual student and see, but that is not, uh, when you're in a leadership role, you're trying to design an effective system in which your teachers mainly can, um, and, and uh, support personnel, can operate in the most effective manner. So we're going to kind of focus in the middle of this today. And then as I say that, I go right back to state level data because once again, that's what I have. So this is one way to look at how your students are doing. Uh, and it doesn't have to be an iLearn score. It can be, you know, your formative and interim assessments that you're doing. Um, particularly interim because it's easier to get the data from that. But if you're doing uh, robust data collection on formative assessments, that's probably the best place to look at some of these things. And uh, multiple disabilities, orthopedic impairment all the way down to other health impairment. And this does give us some um, indication of our students' performance. So on iLearn. Uh, you can see that obviously language and speech impairment is as the primary, is the highest performing subgroup. Um, and um, we have a few students in moderate, but mild is a much higher population uh, where our numbers are in the uh, below 5% pr uh, proficiency and almost basically zero. Because this is the general assessment. Proficiency. This is the general assessment, not, right, but, but a large... Uh, share of the mild uh, uh, students with mild cog or it's not cognitive anymore. I didn't change this, so that's my fault. That's a demerit on me uh, for not changing this because it's intellectual now. But um, uh, a lot of them are taking the I learn, so uh, not I am. Uh, those s numbers there, the the red and blue, those are the ap approaching proficiency and proficient numbers for the students in general education only. So we oh, can so th right here right so we can see that that's where your gap is coming in and we can see that even though our numbers um, were di were disappointing for a lot of people on iLearn uh, we we have st we have a large share of our students that are uh, uh, approaching that proficiency level. Um, uh, let's go to the math one, and we'll talk about the very similar pattern. Uh, the math scores are a little lower, but other than that, it's a it's a very uh, similar story there. 
uh, you can see that the SLD numbers, which we also highlighted last year at, these, at this road show, is under 10% proficiency. Uh, that, is, that is, especially as we get into the higher grades, our primary population of students with a learning disability. Uh, they're also, uh, with the exception of the speech and language impairment, the students that are in the general education classroom the most. So this is kind of an interesting wrinkle on this finding of improvement, but we also have uh, a, a population that is not really performing very well um, given uh, their exposure to the general education uh, curriculum. So we're going to kind of talk about maybe some reasons for that later. Uh, all right, so now we have the not picture of me. I did not include this uh, because I don't wear round glasses, right? So this is not me and uh, my fiance won't let me wear round glasses so I will never look like this person in the picture. Uh, we're talking about levels of analysis again, and we're going to use usually two or three different things uh, in this because we don't want to try to explain the history and the entire philosophical uh, theory of learning here. All right, uh, when you're looking at data, sometimes you look at these sophisticated studies, it can be a very overwhelming, but you'll find that the basic data decision making is, is on fairly um, non-complex data. And you can evaluate how you're, do how you're doing in certain areas by looking at only two or three different things and have a pretty good idea, uh, even if it can't be published in some statistical journal, uh, which uh, are reserved for the, for the specialists. Um, we are, and as I said earlier, uh, a lot of times people get uh, very much uh, caught up on the student level, which is when you're working in a classroom, obviously very important. That's what grading is all about, and we've been doing that, collecting data on that since um, I think Aristotle gave grades, didn't he? Alexander the Great. I think he got an A in conquering, right, for instance. So uh, grades are very old. So data, um, I, don't, I don't think they did A's then, but they did something, they had to do something. Uh, and so great data collecting is, is nothing really new, it's just we have a lot more tools uh, to collect more data these days and uh, standardize our measurements so that the biases that go into some things are less, are less prevalent. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm done with that. We have, I've, and I've talked about this today, you have a criteria, and oftentimes the criteria is a frustrating measurement, to be honest, because you don't know exactly uh, what it is that you're looking for. Uh, when, you, when you teach a specific lesson, by the end you have an objective, but when you're looking at a whole system, your objective is a little more complicated. And so knowing exactly what that number should be is harder, which is why we usually focus more on norm referenced, which is you can compare one thing to another. And you can say this is working better than it did last year, or this is working worse than it did five years ago, or this group is doing better than that group. And that often is um, a more useful tool when you're trying to organize systems changes. Okay, so what I'm doing here, as I said, is very basic. Um, it's comparing two factors and seeing if there's a difference between the two of them. Um, you have one or more factors usually being a category. Uh, oftentimes they're predefined categories, like free or reduced lunch. Uh, sometimes they're things that you have to define. Because if you have um, a certain, you have students, it's like one of these things is not like the other from Sesame Street sort of thing, right? You have to figure out how you're going to define different things to make it meaningful to look at them. If I'm looking, and we're going to show an example from grade levels later, if I look at each grade level individually, I have 13 grades, possibly 14 if you include uh, PK, and possibly 15 if you include uh, adult ed. That's a lot of numbers to look at, and you're going to get lost in those differences. But if you can say, well, ki you know, kindergartners through third graders have a lot in common more than, uh, you know, uh, than a second grader does to a seventh grader, right? Those, that's, that is a very intuitive, basic kind of things. But if you don't do that, it's harder to really get a sense of um, uh, where you should be making cutoffs, right? 
we have to make cutoffs at the Department of Education all the time and then the tests that's all about cutoff scores and they're very fancy sophisticated analysis but after you're done with it you can say well I can see this was based on a couple of things so you can make those decisions uh, at the lower level um, when, when we're not needing to standardize things nearly as much here's some examples of things you could look at uh, there are others uh, please feel free to uh, share any ideas that you have with us. Um, we're going to actually be talking about this in a couple of weeks at a conference, so we're always trying to improve uh, our support in this area. Uh, I talked about primary disability, the uh, summative, interim, and formative assessments. Um, the disciplinary removals. Uh, sometimes you run into an area where you know, you're getting into disproportionality, but uh, if you have a lot of discipline removals, you might not be in disproportionality because you either have a, homo a more homogenous uh, ethnic population or you are uh, just having a lot of removals across the board. So that's not going to show up there. So that's why looking at some of this is, is good. Uh, placement information we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, where is that student? Are they getting exposure to the curriculum and are they being supported when they're there? Attendance. Obviously students who aren't around uh, generally don't learn very well and then grades um, and student groups which are the uh, various categories for demographic groups of different kinds so the structure of the of this uh, is a cross tab or cross tabulation uh, those of you who have um, I think a lot of educational leadership has some stuff on this uh, you are looking at categories and seeing what the differences are across categories two different categories usually so it's set up like this and then all you have to really do is look at the frequencies the percentages of each of those and say well why is it here more than in another place uh, the spreadsheets can do this you don't need to know any kind of uh, sophisticated program but if you can learn a little bit on Excel for instance or Google Sheets if you're so inclined I'm not a big fan of Google Sheets, but, but I need to probably get with the times um, and, uh, and, define, uh, and use that to define your categories, which I've just kind of talked about, and to organize data. So here's an example of an outcome. I'm going to show you how we got to this in a second. These are grade levels, uh, and I was just talking about the logic of defining these. So I put K through 3. Uh, 4 through 6 and 9 and 7 through 12. I could have gone to 9 through 12 or 7 uh, 9 through, and, and made a 7 through 9. You know, you probably want more than 2 but you don't want to get too much out there on some of this because you begin to lose um, lose enough data to make informed decisions about. You've got to have enough kids in each one of these boxes for it to be meaningful in some way. So, uh, and we take a look at the LRE categories, which are big variables, right? Once again, that's a state level variable, but you can use it at the local level, 50, 51, and 52. And what do we see? Uh, this is not surprising, and oftentimes you'll find things that are not surprising at all when you're looking at data, um, is that you start out in the lower grades, and we see this decrease in students in the general education setting as we go on. And so then you have to say, well, why is that? And because you can have things that confound this, right? Things that make this um, information somewhat misleading. And in some respects, this could be misleading. Uh, we have a different population that makes up our special education programs in the later grades. Our students with, that are the primary level of speech are generally exiting out. There are very few students in the state in high school who have a primary disability of speech. Speech is very high 50s. They're in the, it's in the upper 90s for students that are spending most of their day in the uh, general education classroom. So that is, in, that is going to explain some of this change. But then we can also look and add a third element which is can be very powerful to just add the third element. So what I'm going to do now is show you kind of how this was set up so thank you so we look at our data here and this is the data from the uh, last December 1 count of uh, December 2 it actually was uh, um, 2019 
Uh, these are just fake numbers that, uh, well, they're not fake numbers. The numbers are real, but they don't mean anything. Uh, it's because I didn't want to uh, get rid of the STNs. And you just have uh, data like this and then a grade level. I had to put it, we have to put in some sort of grade group. Because once again, I don't want 14 of these. Um, and so this is just the grade, but then we have the grade group. So you go in and you say, well, which group is this going to be in? It's going to be in uh, KG to 3, and so on. Now, if I have 28 kids in a classroom, I can easily go through and just type all these. If I have 182,000 students in the state child count, that would take a while. So this is when the uh, formulas and, that you can do in Excel are, are very powerful. They're not terribly hard to learn. If you get the basics of Excel down, or whatever other kind of program you'll use, it's not hard to pick up new things because there are people on the internet who apparently have nothing better to do than to talk about Excel. And you can Google almost anything and find all these explanations. I have not met any of these people. But they must exist because their product is there. Uh, so it's very helpful for all of us. It's like the Wikipedia art uh, authors. I've never met a Wikipedia author either. But I, they must exist. Um, so anyway, that, that's just some suggestions. There are lots of online courses about Excel if you are not comfortable with data or if you would like to find somebody who is, uh, who can uh, really, um, you know, you can learn a lot pretty quick, uh, even if it's not really your forte. Uh, I also have placement type in here and the primary and secondary disability. So when we do this, we can make what they call a pivot table, which is basically a way to set up a cross tab. And we have our grade groups here, and we have our placement type here. And then I'm going to say, well, I don't want uh, the preschool ones, so I'm going to only do 50, 51, and 52. And then I'm going to put this in here, and I know all of you will memorize everything I'm doing. But you can go back, and you can see the counts. Well, those counts don't mean much to us, so we probably want to change it to percent. I don't want percent. I want percent of row total. Oops. I wish I had a mouse. I saw the other day that children do not know how to use mice anymore. You see, this is de even people as young as, as um, can I use you as an example? Even as people as young as Jessica, she has nothing in common. From a, I mean, her and childhood is completely different uh, than some, you know, because they're like, oh, we don't use mice, we just do this all the time. Uh, so then they get in, the, they have to be taught to use mice in kindergarten. I, I used a mouse. Well, no, I know you did. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> is that it's, it's completely different. So anyway. Yeah, so I wanted to do row total. So there's my differences. All right, so we see that that's that difference, right? It's going down um, as the year, as the grades go by 85, 77, 82. And a lot of times, well, maybe I'd like to add a third thing to this, and I can do the primary exception. And th this is, I use the, uh, find, trying to find insights from disability types, because even though our kids are all individual, this are, the students with the same primary exception have a lot of things in common when it comes to the need of their special ed services. So we can go through and we can just look at these one at a time. This one is orthopedic impairment. I have all these codes memorized because why not um, when you look at them all the time. And we see, you know, there's a lot of, uh, um, or that multiple disabilities, I'm sorry, is one. So that's a population. But the numbers are staying pretty the same in the different grade levels. Whereas orthopedic impairment, once again, uh, staying pretty same. Nothing too exciting happening there. So this does tell you why, just adding this third thing, that some of this story is about the different disabilities because we have nine, which is speech and language. 
and that's almost 100, like I said, and stays almost 100 all the way through. But when we look at mild disabilities, which is one of our categories, uh, we see that we do have somewhat of a more exclusion, and this isn't quite lined up right because it's alphabetical order, but you can see we start at 53, then we get into grades 4 through 6, and it's 49, and then grades 7 through 12, it's down to 43. And students who are partially or separately segregated is going up uh, to over a third. So if we look at that inclusion study that we were just talking about, if we have students that are performing better in the general education classroom, we want to try to keep them in the general education classroom. They're getting exposure to curriculum there that they're not going to be able to get, and they're also getting that exposure to same age peers and the, and the, um, the learning environment that is created by that kind of classroom. However, they are being taken out, a lot of our students, as time goes on. Well, that's not just because people have decided that it would be nice if those students weren't in uh, general education. We can, ex we can extrapolate or, yeah, what's going on here. As students get into the higher grades, they're starting to struggle more and more. They're starting to fail more classes and they are seen to be needing more support. Uh, so the question is, can we provide that support in a way that keeps them with ex that access to that learning environment? Uh, more. So you have the idea of what are the services that we're providing to a company instruction actually like. And that is where there's a lot of expertise that re is required uh, to answer that question and how that's supposed to work. Um, expertise that I certainly don't have, but you have the more of that expertise and also the uh, direct experience working with those kids. So that is kind of a, a, an idea of how you can use this to identify things there. And what we identify there is, let's take a look at the services we're providing in and outside of the general education classroom and what they actually look like. Uh, I talked about the cutoffs. It's a good idea if you don't know kind of intuitively where to make your cutoffs to do categories, to just graph them all out. This is a, a box and whisker plot, um, which is something that I didn't actually learn until college. And then I went back the next year and taught it to high school students, which makes me sound, now I sound old. Yes, yes, time waits for no one. All right, so uh, you can see this is how we looked at the alternate assessment. Uh, and um, uh, zero through one and a half is kind of where they're bulked up, but then you can see where uh, the cutoffs should be, logically. And we talked about this in a meeting, we showed this, uh, and Sarah Moore finally came down with how we should do this, and we all agreed with her because she was very persuasive uh, at that, that the state level was a good place to cut it off. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yes, she remembers. Okay. Uh, that seems like a long time ago. Well, you just had your six month anniversary, but it seems, yeah, it seems like a long time ago. So here are some other ideas that, that I don't have data for, but there are things you could talk about. Are you removing your kids? Discipline data is a very annoying thing to collect, uh, but it can be very valuable. Um, and if you have student information system, you're able to, to do that and make sure that you're doing that with fidelity. Um, partially because it's required, but it, you know, we know that there are some problems with that data. Um, under five removals maybe, five to ten and over ten, um, and in different schools, right? Uh, wh are, where are your differences in schools? And then the next question always is, why are those things different? And sometimes you have a very good explanation for that, sometimes not. Either way, you can use that explanation to, to change your strategies. Uh, we can look at the types of instruction you're getting, either by time um, uh, out or what kind of supports are you providing. Is there a paraprofessional in the room or a resource teacher in the room? Um, if there's a difference between that, well, we either have to make staffing or we have to think about how we're doing uh, our, our paraprofessional uh, training and things like that. Uh, how are students doing out in resource rooms? Um, because we can see that students in that mild category are, are spending a lot more time in that resource room as they get uh, older. And then these are the levels of uh, proficiency. I put those because that's what I have, but I would prefer 
You know, you looking at your formative assessments and your interim assessments, NWEA, stuff like that, uh, more uh, closer to the ground data than uh, this sky high DOE stuff. Okay, finally, uh, we have the very humorous uh, uh, graph here. Uh, I know it's funny because um, somebody told me that it was. <laughs> we, um, that uh, you do have to be careful if you have some unusual situations when you're doing, obviously, comparing percentages because you know what happens when you put that zero in for the non-assignments that average collapses, right? So you have something that's way out that's going to be distorting uh, what you see. And, um, y you know, if, um, uh, if it doesn't make sense when you're looking at that data, if you say, this doesn't make sense to me, you need to go back and look at it because it's very possible your data could just not be, could be skewed in some way. Um, if it doesn't make sense, it's probably not true. That's a Judge Judy quote. Uh, that I used, I used to watch Judge Judy, but not anymore. I have no time. I'm too busy disaggregating data. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is just kind of a summary of what I said. Always be asking the next question from the data that you see. That is what is, that's what gets you thinking about the next steps. And I heard that we had some Indiana uh, Resource Network affiliates we do. And that do here. stuff. And they're here. Yes. Raise your hand, Indiana Resource Network people. They're out here everywhere. Right? <laughs> you can bother them and not us. No, that's not right. That's not what we want. Uh, but they do have a, they have a lot of people that are experts in and have worked with schools on this exact kind of thing and experience. All right. All right. So that's the end of my portion and I will um, turn it back over. Okay, one more final evaluation form. This is for how today was set up. Last year we did a whole day and we had a break for lunch and then we came back. This year we shortened it and we now are going to have some work time. So uh, we'd love to know, did this work for you? Is the shorter better? You know, it is year two, so we don't quite have as much. Or would you have preferred us to go into more depth on certain indicators, which we can do in the future? So please tell us what you think here on how today went. Um, also, please stick around. Like I said, we can be here even till one o'clock so we got two hours that we can be here um, and so we're all going to come walk around now and help anybody with any questions uh, if you'd like to work in teams ask other people we've got the resource centers here uh, you definitely are welcome to leave as well if you'd like to and you've got other things to do um, but thank you very much for coming and thanks to New Albany for hosting us today we really appreciate it